Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name is Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. I'm on the line tonight with Danae Elton. Um, she was one of the first people that reached out to me a couple years ago. Did you know that? No, I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah, you're like, you should email this person and you should talk to my aunt and my brother. And like, you're one of the first people that was like totally helping me. So it was awesome. And I thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Danae, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Yat e shike do shidane, dane elton yenisha, tombahen nisla, bilagana bashashin, kia ani dash shiche do bilagana dash sanale. Um, Cedar City Dinasha, Shima A. Diana Robinson Wulya, Shaja David Robinson Wulya, Shima Sana Dorothy Bitsili Wulya Nit Ea, and Shaja A. Guy Bitsili Wulya Nit Ea. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, that just really touches me to say my grandparents' names. So I have. Deep, deep respect and honor for my grandparents. Um, they joined the church in the 50s after uh, War II. One of their uh, young children had passed away, and my grandma was looking for some answers, and the missionaries met them way out on the reservation in Tohatchi, New Mexico, and told them that they could teach her about the plan of salvation and she jumped on board, read the Book of Mormon, and never looked back, and was a faithful member her entire life. She passed away a couple of years ago, so. And did you know I'm, her? Oh, oh, yes, very, very well, very well. Yeah, I, um, my mom was on the Indian Placement Program, and she was away for, from her family, but uh, I was very close to all three sets of my grandparents. So I had my my father's parents, my Navajo grandparents, and then the foster grandparents that my mother lived with. So I have three sets of family. I, I think that's such a blessing. I love that about my heritage too. I I mean, I I had three sets of grandparents too, and people were like, what? And I'm like, oh yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, it's really crazy because when I look back when I was born, I had 18 living grandparents from the three sets of grandparents. And then my grandparents' parents were alive. And even my great grandparents had parents. And then they were very elderly at the time, but I had that many grandparents and all through my life I've had, I was surrounded by my grandparents. So yes, I was very close to my, my Shemasana and my Nolis. So yes. That is so cool. Yeah. Um, Danae, would you please share something that you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? It can be pretty much anything, a story, a celebration, a way of life, a ceremony. What do you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel? So one of the, there's so many things, but one of the biggest things I love is the acts of service. So in my family, we have a big family reunion every year down on the Navajo reservation and we give away door prizes. We give away things. So the active service of giving to each other, and then that comes back to you in blessings and whatever way you want to think about it in love and kindness, however you want to think about it. And then in, in our LDS faith, we give our tithing, we give our service, our time, and our callings. And in return, we are blessed through that service and that love that we give. So my family, my Navajo family is very big. And then being in the powwow system now, there's all the honor dances, and we're asked to come out and give money donations if we can. And in return, you're given those prayers and blessings back to you. So you give and receive. And I love that about the Navajo culture. 
as well as the LDS faith. So I I interviewed your brother, how long ago has it been? A year and a half? Yeah. So because of that, I know that you grew up in, in Cedar City and you said that in your introduction as well. Um, when you were growing up in Cedar City, how much, um, how much culture growth did you have when you were growing up? I had none. I really didn't know that I was Native American. I mean, I knew I was Native American, but it's a very Anglo white community. I was very accepted by everyone. I was involved in lots of activities, had wonderful friends. We had a great ward family, a lot of family close by. So I had a wonderful childhood, just very involved. And it wasn't until I went to BYU when people started to ask, what are you? What ethnicity are you? I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I look like everybody else. (laughs) And then that was when I realized, you know what? what is going on here? I need to look into my culture a little bit more and figure out what's going on. And we, we hadn't spent a ton of time down on the reservation, but I still knew my grandparents and my cousins, and my aunt, aunts and uncles, but I wasn't really immersed in the culture at all. So it was during college that I did a deeper dive into who I was, spent time on the reservation with my grandma during the summers I went to different ceremonies with her. I drove her around, learned a lot about the family, about my grandmother's conversion to the church. And it was just such a wonderful experience. I also tried out for Miss Indian Scholarship and I competed in the Miss Utah pageant. And that was a big eye-opening experience for me. I we had to dress in cultural dress. My auntie made me a Navajo rug dress. My grandma made me some of the clothing. And so I still have all of those clothing today. And my daughter is wearing them now. And it's such a special gift that I have that from my grandmother to have all those clothes and the regalia that she made for me. And I was in the Navajo Nation parade. It was so cool. I remember they got the car all ready and I sat on top of the car and it was really fun. (laughs) That is so cool. In a lot of ways, what you described, um, I, I, I lived kind of the same kind of thing, but I didn't run for any, (laughs) any pageants. So that's cool. I didn't know that about you at all. Um, I know. So when I, um, first met you in person, it was at the book of Mormon, Uh, filming. Do you remember meeting me there? Yes, I do. Because living the way I did in the Cedar City, the community, I really never met other people like me. Same with BYU. There just wasn't a lot. And I met you and I was like, oh my gosh, my sister would look like. This is, these are my people. I finally felt like I had a place and here I am almost 50 years old feeling finally like I found my group. And it was such a humbling experience and a wonderful experience to meet so many Latter-day Saints that had a similar story to me. And I felt like I belonged, like I had a family immediately. Yeah. It's funny because your daughter was there at the same time. I'm like, she looks just like me. Don't we look like we could belong to each other? (laughs) And then... But I feel like that about you, too. Like, I feel like we look like each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I didn't grow up with a sister. So, yeah, it's it's nice to feel like you're connected to other people. Yeah. So how was your Book of Mormon experience? That experience just solidified my testimony even more than it than I had had before. I didn't know that my testimony could be even stronger. I was completely immersed in the experience. The spirit was so strong on set. And I was one of the lucky few that was cast as a core background. So my title was survivor number 21. And I got to be on set for five to six weeks. And I was there almost every single day of the filming and got to participate in so many of the wonderful stories and the storyline. And to me, all of the people who have such strong testimony of the Book of Mormon, it was 
a very humbling experience, but also very exciting because it's a way for me now to talk about the church. I live in San Diego and while we have a good, strong LDS community here, it's a very large, diverse community. So it is nice to be able to talk about the church and talk about my experience about being in the Book of Mormon videos. Yeah. Were you just one season or did you do more than one season? Season five as well. And I actually, they just did, I was one of the people of Alma. So I was in a prayer circle with Alma and I actually got it like a close up of me praying, which was cool. And then I did some scenes with the Stripling Warriors, which I don't believe that's been released yet. And I got to do season five with my son, who's now currently serving a mission. And then I did season four with my daughter and my younger son, who was one of the children. And he got quite a bit of screen time standing behind Anthony, who was depicting the savior. That was a really cool experience. Is there any particular um, moment or story from from your time on set that um, was special that you could share that is not too sacred to share? Wow, there's so many ex- times that the spirit just felt like it was driving my heart. It One of the biggest was when we filmed the scene of the multitude coming up one by one to touch Christ's body, to touch him, see him, see the prints in his hands. Uh, that was very powerful because they gave everybody on set that moment to go up and touch him and look at him and have that moment. It was really powerful to feel like I'm one with him and he loves me. That was very powerful. Wow. I didn't know that they did that. I wasn't there at that time. So that's, that's really cool. And then there was one other moment, too, when we were filming, he was walking through the multitude doing his teaching, and there was a little bit of a break. And we were asked not to talk to Anthony because he he was reciting so much scripture. It was incredible how he did so many takes without even taking a pause. He went through those lines, the scripture so well, and we were on like a little break. And he turned to me and he said, you and I keep looking at each other. I feel like I should know your name. And so he asked me what my name was. And I told him, well, my name's Danae. And he's like, oh, nice to meet you. And so then every other time on set, when he would see me, he would call me by name. And he would say, hi, Danae. (laughs) So I know he was portraying the Savior, but at the same time, it just felt like I was being seen. And it was a really cool experience. Wow, that is That is really cool. Yeah. Um, So you also mentioned to me that you have done some chosen time. You've you've been an extra in chosen. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. So last year I was cast um, for several days, but the main day that I was cast was a 16 hour shoot when it's actually aired already. It is season four, uh, episode two, when Jesus uh, changes Simon's name to Peter and calls him the rock. And we were part of the background that was in the Caesarea Philippi. We were in the gates of hell. (laughs) And it was a very hot day and a very long, long day out in the open. We had really no cover. We were at a quarry. And, but it was very surreal to see the whole cast of The Chosen walking up to us. And Jonathan Romy was incredible, also delivering his lines as the savior. It was a really cool experience. Again, I had to just pinch myself that this is not real. <laughs> this is TV. But it's done so well that you really feel the spirit and you feel the production is just top notch, I feel. So uh, how many children do you have? I have four. Me and my husband have four children. We met at BYU and we, my husband brought me down to San Diego where he 
his family lived at the time. And I fell in love with San Diego immediately. And we just knew that this is where we wanted to raise our family and where we wanted to be. So you've lived there your whole marriage? 27 years. Yeah, almost 28. That's awesome. And I think we're staying here forever. <laughs> we have to out of San Diego. We love it here. And I didn't realize there was such a big native community until I started powwow dancing a couple of years ago and I've met quite a few of the Native American community here and it's been really uplifting and it's helped me build my knowledge of my culture and the culture of indigenous people here in the United States. It's it's been very eye opening and very heartwarming to meet all these people. So tell us about that. What um what uh, interested you in, in starting powwow dancing? So I, my cousins have, da- have been in a drum group for many years and I've gone to gathering of nations and watch them perform and, and sing. And I've always wanted to dance, but it just seems so overwhelming getting the regalia together. And it just seemed really overwhelming and I didn't know the culture or the customs and all the little nuances that are involved and my aunt has been power dancing for probably 15 years and she says just do it just come just do it jump in there I was like I don't know and then my daughter was dancing with living legends and had quite a bit more knowledge and she said mom come dance with me and I said I don't know I'm not sure yet so It turned out that we were in Tennessee, in Georgia. My daughter was cast to dance in the Echo Marvel show that was on Disney Plus. And so she was out there by herself for several weeks. So I flew out to Georgia to be with her. So she wasn't by herself. And we went to a powwow, a Cherokee Nation powwow in Tennessee and just had the best time it was a small powwow everyone was so nice and at the end as we were leaving a man <clears throat> came up to me his name's Donnie and he said Danae before you leave I I want to give you something he says I have an eagle feather for you and so he said I want you to start dancing you should start dancing and so that was just another witness to me that I needed to start dancing again I've been a dancer all my life, but not in the powwow arena. And so my daughter invited me to join the arena with her. And the first powwow we did was here in in Southern California, the Pachanga Casino here in Temecula. It's a ginormous powwow. And we had the best time. And we were pretty pleased with ourselves because we did a mother-daughter special and we got in the top three. So... <laughs> That was pretty exciting. So I just caught the bug and I realized that you just come as you are. Everybody's very welcoming. It doesn't matter if you have all the regalia. You just build it piece by piece and you're given a little bit here. You build a little bit there. And I've learned how to to bead now on my own. And I've learned some other um, artists, artistic things through my aunts and uncles and other members of the community. So it's, I've learned a lot. It's been really eye opening, but I love it because the power of the drum is real for me. I feel the spirit so strong through dancing and I love the singing and just being together with other Native Americans. And again, I had that same moment as being in the Book of Mormon. I was standing ready to check in at the powwow right before grand entry. And I looked around and I thought, here's my people. This is where I belong. Finally, I feel like I belong. It's just, I don't know how to explain it. When you come from two separate cultures, the white culture and then a native culture, it's, you just feel like you're kind of a fish out of water. You don't know where you sit. And um, both sides of my family, however, are very welcoming and loving. And again, come as you are. Um, it's kind of the culture we've tried to build too in our ward here in in Vista. Just come as you are. We love you. Just that unconditional piece that I love about my culture and the church culture and 
my family. What do you dance at the powwow? I go back and forth between old style jingle and fancy shawl. It just depends on how my body's doing and if my feet can handle it because it's a lot of bouncing and jumping, but it just depends how I'm feeling. But I love both so much. It's so much fun. And I just, I've always felt the spirit through dance. There's just something about the movement and just feeling connected to a power greater that's out there. So, yeah. So um, what kind of dance did you do before? Like you said, you've always been a dancer. What kind of dancing did you do? Growing up in Utah, I was a clogger. I did a lot of percussion. <laughs> and then I also was in jazz and cheerleading. And I actually really, my whole goal was to become a college cheerleader. And I really wanted to go to BYU. That was my ultimate goal. My parents had had season tickets to the BYU football game since, the, I don't know, Jim McMahon era. <laughs> and I really wanted to be a cheerleader. So my mom always had a saying that was, just go for it. Or you never know until you try. So she never let us get out of not trying things because we were scared. She'd always say, just go for it. You never know until you try. So she said that again to me when I was unsure about trying out for the BYU cheer squad. She said, just go for it. <laughs> I said, okay. And lo and behold, I make the team. I make the cheer team. Super excited. And then at the same time, I also got an invitation to dance with the international folk dancers. And I was kind of stuck between two really cool groups, two experiences, but I received my patriarchal blessing when I was 15. So this is a blessing that you receive through a patriarch that's specific for you. And in the blessing, it actually says that boys and girls from BYU were, will travel to the farthermost points of the earth. And I bless you that you will perform well. It's so specific. And as I was trying to decide what I was going to do, was I going to be a cheerleader or was I going to do the international folk dancers? I read my patriarchal blessing and my answer was right there. I was blessed that I would perform well traveling to the farthermost points of the earth. And so I auditioned for the international folk dancers and made the team, met my husband. And for three years, we traveled to the farthermost points of the world, <laughs> performing and dancing. And it was an incredible experience for us. And we just cherished those moments. We danced in Russia and the Ukraine, all over Europe. Um, he did a tour in Canada. Uh, yeah, so we've danced all over the world. That's and pretty awesome. <laughs> I would, I would do it. So yeah, that made my decision easy when you listen to God and just follow the creator's path and have the faith that he's going to lead you in the right direction. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. <laughs> so what did you major in when you were at BYU? I majored in social work. I just really love sociology. I love studying, again, people and culture. And I that at the time, social work was a separate, it was called the School of Social Work. So you couldn't just declare it as your major, you actually had to apply. So again, my mom's, my mom's um, mentorship, try it, you know, what, what can you lose? Just go for it. So I put my application in and I was accepted into the School of Social Work. And I loved my studies in that arena. Um, but as my husband and I, after we graduated, we felt that the best thing would to be home with our children. I wanted to be with my children. So um, in the daytime, I was with my kids. And in the evening, I opened up a dance studio. Some students from this area, they had seen me dance with international folk dancers here in California. And some of the girls at church said, oh, you were one of the dancers that we saw. Can you teach us how to do clogging? And so I opened up a clogging studio for about 15, it was about 15 years. 
had lots of students come through, just wonderful experience teaching kids how to dance. And then as my kids got older, um, I wanted to be part of their high school sports. I didn't want to be at the dance studio. I wanted to be teaching. So I kind of phased out and finished raising our kids as they finished high school, went on missions, and two of them are married now. That's so great. That so I'm in in my head. I'm like, I wonder if uh, I wonder if Danae has done clogging moves in her powwow dance now. Yep, I, yes, I have. <laughs> my son was like, "You had some really good moves, Mom. I saw I saw some clogging moves there." I'm like, "Yep, had to hit some of those old moves." <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So you you raise your kids and two of them are married. One of them's on a mission, right? And the youngest is getting ready to start high school. Okay, so um, you told me that you have uh, gone back to school and now you're a teacher, a special ed teacher? Yes, yeah, special education teacher. Yes, I decided to go back to school here in California in order to substitute teach, you actually have to have a bachelor's degree. And I had a bachelor's degree with my social work. And I was being a room mom, helping at school every day. And I thought, what do I have to do to get paid around here? I'm here every day. So what do I have to do to be a sub? And they said, well, you just have to take a couple of tests. You have your bachelor's degree. And I took the test, passed them, and they hired me immediately and they put me to work. I work at a charter school that's K through 12. I did everything from kindergarten to AP, IB, biology. They would throw me into PE. I even did a long-term sub for fourth grade. And that long-term sub for fourth grade, I fell in love with students with special needs. There were several students in there. And I started looking around what what next? What could I do next? And again, my mom's thing, well, you'll never know until you try. Just go for it. My girlfriend was also getting her teaching credential. And she said, you should do this program I'm doing. And so I went for it and had full support of my husband and my, my kids. And I started on the teaching credential path and got my master's degree. And I've been teaching in special education for the past seven years. It's been a great journey. I've met wonderful families. I work with some a pretty vulnerable population. Um, here where we live, we have a very high Hispanic population. And then we do have quite a few Native American students. And I try to kind of put them under my wing. We do have students that are living with family members off of the reservation here just because it's a better situation. And I've helped a few students get scholarships through their tribes because there's lots of money available for Native American students. They just need to fill out the paperwork. And sometimes that's one of the hardest things to do. But I've been helping my own children and other students to be able to move forward and go to college, which that was always a big thing my grandmother talked about was to get your education education was huge. So you just have so many more opportunities. And I'm really happy I finished my undergrad degree because that gave me the opportunity to get that substitute teaching job and then to move on with my teaching credential. So finish up school, just keep plugging away. It's worth it. Are there any special experiences with any of your your uh, students that you've had that have taught you something in particular or strengthened your testimony in any way? So some students are very difficult. They come from all different family situations. There's a lot of very difficult behaviors, but I always just try to remember that each of these children is a child of heavenly parents and that my job is to see that light in them and that changes my perspective immediately when I'm having a hard time I had one student that was very angry all the time he would yell at me and call me names and finally one day I just sat down with him and I said can I play you a song <laughs> I pulled up some primary song 
I know you're probably not supposed to do that in the public school system, but you know, you, you do whatever you can do to calm a situation. And I think I pulled up, I can't even remember what primary song I pulled up, but he immediately calmed down. I said, what do you think of that song? He goes, that was really nice. I feel really good right here. And he touched his heart. I said, okay. I said, are we able to get through the day now? He said, yeah, I can get through my day. So I try to pull those pieces from my testimony and from my faith to try to bring more light and love to situations. And I had another student that was deaf and he didn't do sign language. I don't do sign language. He had lived with his sister, his mother had passed away, but he lived in Mexico for a few years. So he'd been given language in Spanish and English. And then also he just got cochlear implants as a 12 year old. So everything was new to him. Everything. He hadn't, he didn't know what any, some words were. I was teaching him basic words like he was a three year old and it was a very grinding, difficult experience, but by the end of the year, oh man, I had so much love for that student. He had come so far. He had learned so many words. He was understanding more of the social skills that you learn as a middle school student. And he had a sister that I just had so much love for her taking on this, this child and not having her mother around anymore. I just did everything I could during the school day to show him so much love. And he's gone on to increase his language skills and he's doing really well. So that makes me feel really good when I have those experiences with students. Uh, This year was the first year I had a student with Down syndrome and she was so much fun. She tells you how beautiful you are. You're so beautiful. I love it every day. I just, my day is better because she'll say, Miss Elton, you're so beautiful. (laughs) And then, but then when she does get mad, she'll tell me that she needs to go talk to Jesus and she'll go sit in the corner and and pray to Jesus. So (laughs) tell tell Jesus all her woes. So tell her, talk to him for me too. (laughs) Just so many wonderful experiences. You just can't, you just got to love, love them because there's so much light with them. They're, children of our heavenly father so so i'm here to help them and guide them for a few hours every day it's very rewarding difficult but it's rewarding at the same time you mentioned in passing that your ward is really welcoming um tell me about your ward so our ward we had a very small ward for a long time but they changed the boundaries and now our ward is much bigger and it's so great. We have more youth now in the past. My kids were probably the only ones, you know, doing the sacrament and not very many kids coming to activity. So it was very taxing, very difficult because you were just, you were one calling and then you'd rotate to the next calling. We were all just like rotating callings all the time, but Now we're a much bigger ward. Um, We have people from all walks of life and it doesn't matter if you come in your blue jeans or whatever, just come, come as you are. We will love you. We love that you're coming to partake of the words of Jesus Christ and that you want to get closer to him and you want to build a relationship with your heavenly father. That's the goal. The goal is to bring people closer to Jesus. So. Yeah. When Mark and I first got married, we were in a pretty small ward and it was like most of the callings there were callings of desperation, not so much inspiration. (laughs) And in that kind of a situation, we clung to each other. Like our friendships from that ward are we still care about each other because because we did we had to cling to each other. So that kind of sounds like I, it makes me think of what you just described. Yeah, it we uh, we had kind of an older population as well, so there wasn't very many children. So the primary was very small, 
And then even our young women's group was pretty small. But yeah, we we really bonded with one another. And you truly are brothers and sisters because you're so close in trying to keep your testimony strong and building each other up and trying to spread the love of Christ to your community around you. Um, speaking of testimony, what are some of the things that you have done through your life to ensure that you have a strong testimony? So the biggest thing for me is reading the scriptures and really feeling a connection into how that can help me keep my fire burning, I guess, because you do go through ebbs and flows of of spiritual growth. And it can be easy to get off the path and get a little, I don't want to say bored, but a little tired of pushing through. But um, I, I just cling, I guess, to the scriptures. I, I also cling to the testimonies of my parents and my grandparents. That always helps me because I know with my grandmother, she was very versed in the Bible, but having priesthood in her home, that was such a huge concept for her. And she always just said how wonderful the having the priesthood in your home is and we should never um, uh, take that for granted to have that that power in our home. So uh, if when I'm feeling down, I try to get to the temple. It's, it's really difficult right now. Our San Diego temple is closed. So it's a great sacrifice now for us. We have to go up to the Newport Beach temple or to the Redlands temple. So it's quite, a, it's kind of a full day trip to go to the temple now. But when I need that boost of spiritual guidance, the temple is a place that I go to get that guidance. That's awesome. Um, how far away are those temples from you? Depending on traffic. <laughs> That's the thing that gets you is the traffic. It's about an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes, even an hour and a half time away and then they're very small temples so you have to get an appointment and it's not always guaranteed so we're out four to six weeks to even get an appointment to go to the temple so it's quite a bit more of a sacrifice where the san diego temple was about a 40 minute drive and they had sessions all day long anytime but that temple's under construction now yeah. So I, I love going to the temple. I love doing family history. I've been able to do some family history from my Navajo side. We, Yeah, it's, it's very difficult, but I've been able to find little nuggets here and there on the census. And my mom and I have been able to collaborate and work together to do quite a few family members with the permission of other family members. We've been able to find uh, names to take to the temple. It's been a really, really cool experience. So my my fan on my mother's side is is pretty small. <laughs> I'm sure you know, <laughs> but I know at some point we'll be able to take their names to the temple or work with them or somehow we're going to meet and make it work. Yeah, totally. Um, are there? Um people in your life that have really made an impact on you? I have so many strong women in my family. I have my grandmother, my mother. I have aunties, my cousins. I have two best friends that are strong, wonderful women. I've had teachers. I've had dance instructors. I've had so many wonderful mentors throughout my life high school teachers. When you live in a small community like Cedar City, my science teacher was also my young women's leader and she was my neighbor. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I have so many wonderful, strong women that I can lean on when I need help. There's my sister-in-laws. My husband has four sisters. There's just so many wonderful women that I lean on. And now my coworkers, I have some very strong women coworkers that 
when you hear their life story, you're amazed at their strength and their humility. I, I just am buoyed up by their strength. So, yeah. Well, speaking of that, um, has there been anything, is there a hard thing that you've gone through and how did you get through that hard thing? So about, I think it's been, my goodness, now like 15, 12, 12 years ago, there was a market crash here in San Diego with the real estate. I think it was nationwide, but we had put a lot of money into real estate and we lost a lot of money. And then we also lost our home to foreclosure and we just didn't know what we were going to do. It was a very difficult time. And we, my husband and I, we just had to lean on each other. And we have a saying too, that everything always works out for us. We're not sure how it's going to work out, but everything always works out for us. And we lost our home. We had to move. And one of the, here's a little miracle that happened. We, it was just very difficult to even find a place to rent in San Diego at the time. And it turned out that there was a house down the street that we saw it said for rent. And my husband called and it turned out to be his old scoutmaster. And as soon as he heard my husband's phone, um, his, his, uh, voice, he said, Oh, Winston, we want you in our ward. He said, of course you can rent my house. He, he didn't ask for any, anything. He just knew us, knew our family uh, kind of knew our reputation and immediately rented a house to us. And that was such a huge miracle. And we moved into the ward that we're in now. And again, it was that small ward, but we've just watched it blossom and grow. And in the end, we, we were able to recover financially and we're better than we have ever been. And that was just a really terrible thing I never want to go through again, <laughs> but we were able to get through it through the help of other members that knew us. And that was a really humbling experience knowing that Heavenly Father knew that we were going through this time, but he sent us a little, a little line to keep us strong. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's been so awesome to, to hear all these things about you and just, just experiencing life. I, I mean, you, you kind of mentioned it, that there are just so many good people in your life and so many small blessings and, and answered prayers here and there. And I love that so much because that, that to me is living the gospel. So I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I have one final question for you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? Knowing I belong to the tribe of Israel makes me know that I have a place where I belong. That Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, they're very aware of me. And I know that I have a place to call home anytime, anywhere. So I have a place where I belong. Thank you so much, Danae. I have really appreciated this time. There are a lot of interesting things going on in the world right now. You might even say a lot of them are signs of the times. And I think they are. I think they are signs of the times. And so the question is, are we ready? Are we living up to the covenants that we've made? Are we living... Uh, so that we could help in different ways? Are we filling our, our lamps? Are we showing up? Just a lot of questions like that, right? Uh, I was talking with one of my friends today and she said that her sister had to give a talk in Sacrament this past Sunday about the Ten Virgins. So that really got me thinking as well. Uh, there 
are a lot of um a lot of YouTube channels I've been tuning into lately and they've been talking about how the Book of Mormon shows us uh different aspects of the temple and I'm learning a lot from that and it's filling my cup and it's filling my oil lamp <laughs> um one of my friends today was talking about about food storage and she's just talking about how a, about a year ago they moved into our ward and she had a different job and so mortgage and and uh salary were different so she was like food storage was down her list of things to do and I understand that but I think we all need to evaluate ourselves on our on our journey are we are we doing our best to fill those lamps and our and keep our covenants just some food for thought um I know I could do better on different things. I think we all can. But I kind of, I'm honestly excited about the signs of the times coming and showing and being here. I, I'm, I'm doing my best. And I think that that's what Heavenly Father wants us to do is do our best to live the covenants that we've made. And that's my encouragement for you this week. I hope you're doing your best to live those covenants and that you um, find joy in knowing our Savior. And I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.